We've got two interesting data sets that are a byproduct of the product, and we've published a couple of papers recently, just academic ones, on what that data means. So the first data set is all the vulnerabilities and assets that our customers have. Uh, you can think of that as describing enterprise environments. We've got about 400 enterprises in there. It's up to 4.7 billion vulnerabilities, over 15 million assets. And an asset is an IP, a database, whatever you scan in with a Koala scanner, or a Veracode, or Tenable, or Rapid7. Got 20 scanners in there. And that data is asset, vulnerability, and then we try to figure out the risk of those. And so this is where the second data set comes in, which is super interesting. And that's what my team curates. I run data science at Kenneth Security. Um, we have what I think is the most comprehensive data set of in the wild exploitation. So not necessarily a breach, maybe nothing happened, but when a vulnerability is successfully technically compromised, an IDS signature gets triggered, that vulnerability exists on that box, so then all of a sudden you know that there was a technical compromise, maybe that box has nothing on it, maybe it's the PDF to the subway menu for the day, but a compromise is possible. And so we use that to train probabilistic measures for every vulnerability and to build machine learning models. And this talk is an exercise in that and doing that with mostly open source data by combining the threat intelligence piece and the vulnerability management piece. So for everybody who just trickled in, I'm the chief data scientist of Canada Security. We have two data sets. One is all of vulnerability management application security, 4.7 billion vulnerabilities. We're going to pull that out and look at it. The other one is um, IDS signature hits to open vulnerabilities, reversals of malware from Symantec reversing labs, proof point email taps, essentially any time an attack is used. And I don't care about the IP address of threat intelligence. I don't care about the threat actor. I don't care about the IOC. What I care about is this attack path was used in a compromise, and either it tried and wasn't successful or was successful. And in machine learning, we call that an outcome measure. So we can build a whole bunch of models from it. But we don't have to go that far. Um, the central thesis of this talk, if you take nothing else away, it's that these two data silos describe the silos of security in general. On one side, you've got detect and respond, which is what your SOC sees, what your IDS sees, all of the actual events and alerts that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. On the other side, you've got the prevention side of the house which in my world means vulnerability management, application security. It could be configuration management. It could be I deployed a firewall, so I think I mitigated some future potential risk. And while they are siloed today, they don't have to be. All I'm going to do is I'm going to pick pieces of data from each side and show you how the combination is more powerful than looking at it alone. Um, further reading, after this I'll talk about it too, is our, uh, we hired Cientia Institute, which is the guys who did the DBIR, Jay Jacobs and Wade Baker, uh, to write some academic journal papers. There's three reports called Prioritization to Prediction, where we go in depth into this. There's know, 110 pages total. We can do a deep dive, and all of that is open, and all the data is available. And then I wrote a paper with Dan Gear recently about, called Remember the Recall, which essentially says, if the issue in security is that we don't have enough analysts to hire, and there's a shortage, then the answer is automation. And what we can automate depends on bringing threat intelligence together with the data about the preventative controls that we can take to make sure those preventative decisions are efficient. So let's dive in. Threat intelligence today is mostly millions of indicators and billions of events. Somebody says, I have an indicator. What that really means is they've got either a regular expression or the presence of some file indicates that there's a compromise and that might or might not be malicious. We've got billions of events. Even once you go past your silence filters, the average analyst spends about six minutes per alert to make a decision whether or not it's malicious. And that wouldn't be a problem if it was like 50-50 and half of the alerts were malicious. But the reality is that maliciousness is actually really rare. Um, this isn't a problem unique to security. This, is, this happens in disease. This happens in legal document review. We know these problems. Or this happens in instances of cancer. Everybody might have a screen and say, you're positive, but that doesn't mean that the test is actually true. So what does maliciousness rare mean? It means the data sets are imbalanced. Only about 2% of vulnerabilities are ever used in a successful compromise. Only about half a percent of alerts are ever actually malicious alerts that you have to follow up on. But making that mistake is expensive, because the most expensive resource we have is time. So this is all about optimizing our time. How do we be efficient with it? Well, one way is to combine those two data sets I was talking about. 
Here you're looking at two and a half years of reversing labs data. There are 46 million events, alerts, attributed to malware here. All of them are successful in that they are already on the box, and then we figure out how the malware got in there. And this is just the subset of malware that is tied to vulnerabilities. The size of each rectangle you see there is the number of unique malware samples attributed to that vulnerability. Each box represents a CVE. And the color density is the number of successful exploitations that you see on that vulnerability. So a couple of things become immediately really apparent here. One is that the one with the most malware samples is CVE 2010-2568, that top left over there. Um, and from the detect and response side of the house, it would seem like that is the most malicious vulnerability in the world. It's got tons of variants. It's hard to detect. It'll split by your filters if you're not updated. But we've seen 73,000 successful exploitations on it. And if you're not looking at how often somebody's actually been compromised in that, if you don't have the metadata from the outcome measures, you might think this is the most important vulnerability out there. But the reality is that 2012-0185 has only two malware samples. But in the past two and a half years, 300,000 successful compromises have occurred on that vulnerability. So combining those lenses, what do I fix and how many alerts is it generating, is what's allowing me to make these distinctions between is this actually malicious, is this risky. Um, but that's just two in the details. The real takeaway here is that you've got 299 CVEs here, and maybe 20 of those boxes are responsible for 90% of the successful alerts that you see. Which means that if you remediate 20 vulnerabilities out of your environment, your analysts no longer have to deal with 46 million alerts on the SOC side. They have to deal with 2 million. And they're not taking six minutes per alert. They might take 30. And they'll be a lot more efficient and effective with their time, and they won't miss anything. So the idea is that there's a feedback loop here where the decisions we make on the preventative side need to be filtered through the lens of, are we helping the rest of the security team be more efficient? What's our outcome? Well, if our outcome is reducing number of alerts so that when we do see alerts, we can take the time to investigate them, then vulnerability management should not be about Patch Tuesday or CVSS, or I heard in the news that this thing is going to be a really big deal. It should be about what types of vulnerabilities, which ones specifically does my threat intelligence tell me are likely to cause an alert in my enterprise. So over the past five years, we've seen 8 billion successful alerts through this data collection that we do at Kenna. We've seen, we get it from Proofpoint reversing labs, uh, a backdoor into the Alien Vault product, um, IC SAN Storm Center, most recently recorded Future. All of those are an alert happened, and we know that that alert was successful in compromising the vulnerability. 46 million of those are attributed to malware, and that constitutes 28,000 unique malware samples. So think about that. You have to have 28,000 different signatures deployed in Carbon Black or in Silence to block all those, or you can remediate 299 vulnerabilities. And that is only possible if the threat intelligence is feeding your vulnerability management program and not living in the silo of detect and respond. Let's go deeper. That's just malware. So our goal is to reduce risk, to stop the probability of a vulnerability actually causing a compromise in our environment. And all I have to do about that is look at data. We don't have all the data in the world, but this is what we know about vulnerabilities. Today, when a vulnerability is discovered, it takes some time for it to become public. Sometimes it never does if it's an expensive zero day. Most of the time it does, and it gets up into MITRE and then into NVD. When it gets public, when it gets published, we get a bunch of data about it. We get metadata that is the description, the reference links, the CVSS score, uh, the platform enumeration, so which specific versions of specific products are affected, and the weakness enumeration, which is really just this is this type of exploitation. It's a buffer overflow. It might be information leakage, who knows. But what's important to recognize is that all of that metadata is really just somebody writing up the vulnerability. It is no different than a blog post of somebody describing, I know how to compromise this specific software. When you think about what CVSS is, it's six or nine, depending on how deep your CVSS scoring goes, categorical variables that are text mined out of a description. Is this a remote co code execution? Is the access vector local or remote? They don't test the vulnerability to do that. A bunch of people, seven, at the National Vulnerability Database will read the description of the submission from Microsoft or from a white hat hacker or however that vulnerability was found, and then assign values to those six variables, and that's what we use to make our decisions. And so that's the preview for the talk. It's that those six are insufficient, but we no longer have to manually assign variables to them. That text data, the richness of that text document, 
is what we need to analyze in order to make decisions about the risk the vulnerabilities pose. But thankfully, the description is not all we have because the rest of security has spent 20 years creating a whole bunch of sensor data. And that data is what we use on the SOC side, and that data is what guides our threat intelligence. Four events or four things can happen to a vulnerability after it's published. They don't have to happen, but they can. The first is that somebody like Qualys or Rapid7 or Tenable can write a signature for it, which means that when you run that scan on that agent, you can detect the presence of that vulnerability on a box. And then we know that that vulnerability exists in a customer's environment. For us, it means that you know that that box is affected by it. Then an IDS or an IPS vendor can write a signature to detect the exploitation of that. If they do and we see it exploited in the wild, then we know that an event occurred which is related to that vulnerability. Uh, somebody can publish an exploit for it, which means that anybody can go grab that code and use it. That could be in Metasploit, that could be an exploit DB, that could be on a black hat exploit kit. This is why we have threat intelligence to identify those. And then somebody can release a patch for it, which means that the mitigation exists that's just upgrading the software or maybe some one-off patch. And then that patch can or can't be deployed. So what's interesting here is that those first two, a vulnerability existing and us knowing that it's exploited in the wild, we don't know if the signature was written at all. All we know is that the vulnerability exists. So in my data, if I see a vulnerability, I know that a signature was written for it. If I don't see it, maybe nobody has that vulnerability. Maybe Qualys didn't write the signature yet. And so armed with this data, which is every vulnerability is a document describing a problem. I need to figure out which ones are risky. I know a couple things about them. Sometimes people have them. Sometimes they get hit. Sometimes people write exploit code for them. And sometimes patches exist. What can I learn about them? Well, the typical thing that you hear is that vulnerabilities are increasing more and more, getting released every day. And that does seem to be true. This is the volume of CVEs over time, except that these spikes aren't random. In 2005, that boost that you're seeing is that they automated the vulnerability submission process. MITRE and NVD used to have one person accepting those vulnerabilities. All of a sudden, they got a team that could accept more submissions. Their capacity went up. But all of those vulnerabilities still existed. It's just that they had a problem with the backlog. So all of a sudden, we're at a different cadence. The little spikes up to 1.2K that you see is actually two rogue researchers went wild and started writing SSH bugs in every tool that they could find, even though it really should have been one vulnerability, and they had no quality control on the data. In 2017, what happened is NVD realized that they couldn't handle all the submissions themselves, and they created the CAN process, Certified Numbering Authority, some backwards way of making that acronym. So essentially, Microsoft can submit their own CVEs now. And so can a white hat hacker if they've done a good amount of submissions before. And so can bug crowd. And so can about 30 different entities. And that list is growing and growing. And so all of a sudden, there are more vulnerabilities coming out. Qualys is not keeping up with writing the signatures for all those vulnerabilities. And not all of those vulnerabilities are actual risks. Attackers only use a small portion of them. And only a small portion of them are actually effective. So which ones are? Um, when we slice all of the vulnerabilities in that data set, it's 121,000 CVEs in the National Vulnerability Database. Uh, go way deeper into this graphic in the Prioritization to Prediction Report, Volume 1, available online. There's a PDF. But essentially, when we look at that threat intelligence data of what has an exploit and what's being hit, and we overlay that on top of all of the National Vulnerability Database, we learned that 77% of CVEs have never had an exploit written for them and have never had a successful observed exploitation. That means that those vulnerabilities, if you're remediating them, do not pose a risk to your environment. The only way to exploit them is a zero day. Perhaps they're not even detected on your systems whatsoever. So most of the risk is concentrated in the 24% of vulnerabilities on the right-hand side of this thing. Am I doing right and left wrong? Yes. 21% um, have a published exploit, which means there's an entry in exploit DB, or Shodan found some blog post that says something about it, or Metasploit, or um, D squared Elliot, or Canvas have a published exploit for this thing. We know about it. Um, but that doesn't mean that exploit is ever used. That doesn't even mean that it could work, because people submit things to exploit DB all the time that never work. They're just proof of concept. They're not automated, weaponized exploits. 1.8% of those CVEs have actually seen successful exploitations in the wild. And this is what I mean by maliciousness is rare. The goal of vulnerability management is not to fix every vulnerability. Nobody has the time to do that. We all have millions. The goal is to remove the ones that pose the most risk to your environment. And we need to identify that 1.8% really precisely. So this could be the end of the talk if we wanted to just fix every vulnerability that exists today in our environments. Get the data. I just told you the people where you can get it. 
overlay it over your environment, remediate that 1.8%, and you're done. Except it doesn't work that way. It's a stochastic process. Attackers are developing new exploits, new vulnerabilities are coming out. We need a process for identifying what is it about a vulnerability that makes it a risk to our environment or makes an attacker likely to use that vulnerability successfully. The problem actually gets even more precise when you look at which vulnerabilities we can see in our environment at all. Remember I said we can only detect a vulnerability if Qualys or Rapid7 or Tenable write a signature for it? Well, it turns out they only write signatures for about 30% of vulnerabilities in the National Vulnerability Database. For 70% of them, we just don't know and we'll never see them. So this, each square is about 1,000 CVEs, and this is looking at 4.6 billion vulnerabilities um, that exist live today on enterprise systems across 400 enterprises. Um, of those, 5,000 are ones that a scanner has identified on a network, and we see an exploitation associated with that vulnerability. The rest, the blue that you see there, is everything that a scanner has identified that has never been observed to have a hit on it. Which means that if your vulnerability management practice is, let's remediate everything on patch Tuesday, something like 80% of your work is remediating vulnerabilities that don't actually pose a risk to your environment, when you might be missing ones that are. Everything you see on the right-hand side of this thing are vulnerabilities that we have some data about. Some of them have been used in exploitation. But your vulnerability management scanner does not. And so then asset inventory, CMDBs, become the way that you address those kinds of risks. It's not through vulnerability management. Let's talk about how we figure out what it is that we should be remediating. Well, today we use CVSS. And this is an interesting chart. You've probably seen a lot of charts of CVSS by vulnerability or NVD breakdowns. But what you have not seen is what it looks like in the wild and actual customer environments. Take 4.6 billion vulnerabilities, group them by their CVSS scores, and this is the chart that you get. The top gray bars are how many of each kind we've ever seen in a customer environment. So you've got 650 million CVSS9 vulnerabilities that are out there today across those 400 enterprises. You've got about 540 million CVSS10 vulnerabilities. And the dark blue here are those vulnerabilities that actually have an exploit or have seen a successful exploitation. I'm going to let that sink in for a while. What that really means is that if your process is to remediate CVSS10 vulnerabilities, 17.6% of those that are out there in the wild are ones that an attacker actually cares about. The other 80% are a waste of your time. Identifying which of those CVSS10 vulnerabilities are actually a risk to your environment is what we're going to do today. But if you zoom out of this chart and take a look at it, no strategy that uses CVSS gets you better than 20% efficiency. So CVSS 5, CVSS 7, it doesn't matter which one you pick. These bucketings into scores of CVSS are not giving us enough precision to be able to identify with anything better than 20% efficiency what we should be going after. So you know the best that you can do here is just remediate the CVSS 5s. You're fixing information disclosures. A disproportionate percentage of those have exploitation, have exploits out there. But that's not a strategy. That's throwing darts at a wall. It's not enough to talk about the vulnerabilities themselves, though. It's, we need to talk about what it is that we're actually doing and what attackers are doing to figure out what the right strategy is. When we look at what goes unpatched, this graphic is really interesting. And in two slides, we'll look at the flip side of it, which is what is getting patched. But 18% of Java vulnerabilities remain open. Only 7.2% of Acrobat vulnerabilities remain open. Only 3% of Windows 10 vulnerabilities remain open. What does that mean? If you really think about it, think about how easy it is to patch a Windows 10 vulnerability and how difficult it is to patch a Java vulnerability. It means we're going down the path of least resistance. We do what vendors enable us to do, and good on Microsoft for making it super easy to deploy a patch. But that doesn't mean that we're addressing risk. That means that we're doing what it, what's easy to do in our environment. Attackers, though, don't think that way. This is a chart that shows the timeline from the time the vulnerability was released to the time that we saw the first exploitation on that vulnerability out in the wild. And so this isn't a lot of data, um, but breaking them down by products tells an interesting story. Apple and Mozilla and SSL vulnerabilities will take over 100 days to see the first exploitation after the release of the vulnerability. What does that mean? That means that attackers aren't figuring out new vulnerabilities and writing exploits for those products. It means that they're looking through the National Vulnerability Database, figuring out ways to exploit known vulnerabilities. And that process takes time. It takes software development. And only then do we see those attacks. 
When you look at Adobe, though, it's completely different. It might take, it might come out before the vulnerability does that exploit. It might come out three days after, it might come out five days after. But if you look at those bars, that's the 25th and 75th percentile, Adobe is somewhere between three and 40 something days for the median exploitation timeline. And if you look at the very middle of it, you're looking at about 21 days. So if your SLA on criticals is 30 days, you already blew it for every Adobe vulnerability you remediated. Those are already being exploited by the time you've met that SLA. If you look at Microsoft, this is all over the place, right? It looks the same as the grand total. You've got some things that are being exploited in seven days, 14 days. You've got some things that might take a year. And that's because Microsoft isn't a specific enough breakdown. It's a humongous vendor. Something like an ISS vulnerability might get popped in seven days. Something that requires user interaction, like a PowerPoint or an Office vulnerability, might take 90 days to develop an effective exploit. So what, that, what this data tells me is that I need to go deeper. I need to break it down by more products. And we're going to do that later. But the takeaway here is that attackers don't think about your environment, your assets, or your vulnerabilities in terms of CVSS. They think about what can we pop quickly. And if your SLAs are then based on those risk criticality buckets, they're not aligned with what attackers are doing. You should be remediating Adobe in seven days, Adobe criticals in seven days, Apple criticals in 90 days is fine. You're still meeting the mark based on that threat intelligence data that's telling us what it is actually risky. If we look at what we're actually patching and how quickly we're doing it, it does not align at all with what attackers are actually exploiting. So if you look at this, um, green is the top 25% of performers, blue is the median, and red is the bottom 75% of performers. So it takes 14 days to patch the average Microsoft vulnerability. Unsurprising, everybody does a good patch Tuesday cadence. Um, but those that perform poorly take about 130 days. For Google, which when you think about what's Google from Qualys, Tenable, or Nessus, it's really Chrome vulnerabilities, it takes about 15 days for the top performers, 63 for the median. And if you go further down, you're looking at Cisco and Oracle. We're in the 125, 200 for the average performer, maybe a year to patch that vulnerability because those might be critical systems. It might be difficult. It might require code rewrites. What's the story here? We do what is easy. If a vendor enables us to easily deploy patches, those are the patches that we're going to deploy. That does not mean the risk is concentrated there. What's really funny about this chart is that if you look at the top performers, what this chart is telling you is that people will deploy a Microsoft Patch Tuesday patch faster than somebody will restart their laptop in an enterprise environment. Chrome will auto-update if you restart, right? So it takes 15 days for people to patch a Chrome vulnerability. It could not be any easier if you click the update button but we deploy Microsoft patches faster than we do that, which is mind-blowing to me. Um, all this to say, good on those vendors that make it easy, like Red Hat, Debian, Microsoft, Google. Every vendor should have that responsibility, but it is our responsibility to figure out when something is out of band, when something is difficult, how much effort should we be putting into it. So let's think about what I've really covered so far. What I've really covered is how efficient can we be with our time? How much effort do we really need to put in when it's difficult to remediate a vulnerability? What I haven't covered yet is how do we cover all of the risks that are out there? Because you can be really efficient and really effective if you just remediate one vulnerability a year and it's the right one, but that doesn't mean you've addressed any risk. So think about those two concepts as I go through the next thing, which is, am I using my time efficiently? Am I putting effort towards the things that require effort towards the vulnerabilities that are hard to patch but pose a huge risk to my environment? What does that mean in the real world? So let's say, You've got, this is actually real data. This is a synthetic sample that I pulled from five kind of customers, and I just randomly chose assets and then combined them. If you pick 26,000 assets at random, you get about 3.2 million vulnerabilities. It tells you something about vulnerability density today in most enterprises. And if you think about how many alerts that enterprise sees, uh, best estimates I got from like VSIM surveys are for 10,000 assets, you might see 300 million alerts a year, so maybe a billion here. Of course, you're not addressing every alert. You probably have a bunch of rules and filters and some machine learning software in place. And so you're addressing 10% of those. That's still 100 billion alerts. So if you address that through the lens of the SOC, you spend six minutes per alert. You need a lot of people. You need to hire a lot of people. That's really difficult. But let's say we want to address the risk of malware for that environment through the lens of vulnerability management to make the SOC's life easier. 3.2 million vulnerabilities, only 64,000 of them are malware exploitable as of today. And of those, only 22,000 are remote code executable malware exploitable. Of those, only 14,000 are on popular targets, which is what I call the top 5% of software. Essentially, 
uh, if you look at all of the vulnerabilities that we've scanned in, in that 4.6 billion data set, I look at the ones that occur most frequently because if I'm an attacker, that's a target of opportunity for me. So the risk probably resides there. So we've got 14,100 malware exploitable RCE vulnerabilities on things like Oracle, Java, and Microsoft, and popular targets. But the real solution is that there's only 92 patches that you have to apply across this enterprise to remove the risk of malware exploitable vulnerabilities from your environment, thereby reducing that 100 million alerts to significantly less, allowing you to focus on the rest. Um, that real world example will sync a lot better if you actually look at your own data, if you grab a slice of like, what's my DMZ look like in Qualys? How much of that could actually have a piece of malware associated with it? What of it is remote code executable? How much work does it take to slice that out? What you're doing there is you're not threat modeling, you're risk modeling, which is I think the natural extension of where vulnerability management goes. So the solution to a problem of 44 million alerts is you can fix those 44 million alerts and keep addressing them over time, or you can address the root cause, which is only 299 vulnerabilities. And if you think about this chart, that's 299 vulnerabilities across 400 customers across two and a half years. Nobody in this room has all 299. If you overlay this data over your own environment, you might have 50 of these. You might have 40 of these, because you're not running all the software that all of these folks are running. And so if you remove those 40 vulnerabilities, you know that none of these 44 million alerts are going to pop up again, and everything you're seeing is something new not related to that. Everybody's job becomes much easier. So that's the deep dive into the data, and we don't have a lot of time left. I'm going to spend 10 more minutes on one chart, kind of tying it all together, and then I'll leave room for questions. A couple concepts I talked about. One was efficiency, which is, are you wasting time? Are you remediating things that don't pose a risk? One is coverage, which is, are you addressing all the risks in your environment? You can think about it this way. If I've got 100 machines and one of them is infected, which is probably the case, maliciousness is rare, and every day I walk up to my CISO and I say, nothing's infected. My accuracy is 99% every time, but I'm doing a terrible job. So accuracy is a terrible metric, which is what CVSS really tries to get us towards, is being accurate with how we describe a vulnerability, how we assess it. So we need to be efficient, which is to say, when I make a prediction about something, it should be right. So let's say I said, let's remediate 10 of these machines. Let's, I think 10 of them are infected, but only one of them really is. Then my efficiency is 10%, right? If, it's, if in those 10, that one machine is contained. And 10% is a pretty terrible efficiency, because if I had more data, if I was smarter, I would say, let's only remediate five of those, and then my efficiency would be 20%. Of course, it's very easy to say, let's remediate one vulnerability. If you know that vulnerability is a risk, like let's fix struts, then your efficiency is 100%, but you've only addressed one of the tens of thousands of risky vulnerabilities out there. And so this is the trade-off, and this is not a trade-off specific to security. This is the trade-off in all machine learning problems. If you do a Google search, it can give you really precise results, or it can give you a lot of results. It gives you precise results, it's going to miss some of the information you're looking for. It gives you a lot of results, it's hard to filter that noise, it's hard to remediate them. If you look at breast cancer screening, we do mammograms first because we know that we're going to get more people than actually have breast cancer, and then we do a biopsy follow-up to make sure that it's correct. If you look at legal document search review, we'll look at a cache of documents and say, let's have the lawyers look at 5% of them. But why don't we do that in security? Because what we're doing is we're saying, here are a bunch of documents about vulnerabilities. Let's have our security team look at all of them instead of adding that slice up front. And so what is that slice? What should that slice look like? Well, if you want to cover 100% of the risks, that's a really easy vulnerability management strategy. You just have to remediate every vulnerability in your environment. The problem with that is it's expensive. So there's a natural trade-off between having a lot of coverage and being very efficient. And where that trade-off is all about modeling, is all about data, is all about your confidence in knowing that something is risky or, or isn't. Um, but it's certainly not saying, let's fix CVSS 10. Take a look at the CVSS 10 chart bubble in the left-hand side. It's close towards the bottom. Below it is a dotted line. That dotted line is random chance. If I randomly pick one of the 121,000 vulnerabilities in the National Vulnerability Database, and I throw a dart at it, and then I remediate that in my environment, the probability that I'm remediating something that has an exploit or a successful exploitation in the past six months is 21%. So random chance if I'm randomly picking vulnerabilities, 21% efficiency. CVSS 10, if I randomly throw a dart at one of those, you get about 23% efficiency. 
which is not a significant improvement, and it means that eight, four out of five vulnerabilities that you're remediating are a waste of your time. And now look at where it is on the coverage chart. It's got about, I think, 7% coverage. So 7% of the known exploited or exploitable vulnerabilities out there are CVSS tens. If you remediate all of them, you'll have 7% coverage with your vulnerability management strategy. How do we do better than that? Well, if you do CVSS 7 plus, you do significantly better. That dot is somewhere in the middle. And that's about 33% efficiency and 55% coverage, which means one in three of your actions is actually effective at reducing risk, and you've got 55% coverage. About half the things that we know are risky are removed from your environment. But look at the size of that bubble. And this is where it, it really hits the pavement. The size of that bubble is how many vulnerabilities or how much effort you would have to put in to achieve that strategy. And think about what I'm saying there. Well, first of all, it's about 30,000 CVEs that you have to remediate out of an environment to get to that, which might take years for the average organization. But second, what am I really saying there? I'm saying, here's a slice of the data. We fix this, we don't fix this. When we get here, we've achieved some level of efficiency and coverage. That's not a very stochastic strategy for a very stochastic market. All of these, all of these little bubbles, and there's a deeper dive in the prioritization to prediction reports, are these kind of dogmatic strategies that we use. We look at the cert lists, we do Microsoft Patch Tuesday, we patch these vendors, we do uh, criticals, we do CVSS 7 plus and Microsoft vulnerabilities. All of those are slices of the data in half that tell us we fix this, we don't fix this. And how much time it takes to get there, how much effort you have to put in to achieve that strategy is largely ignored because we don't think about efficiency. We think about, is this strategy accurate? So what's a better way? Well, if you assign a probability of exploitation to every vulnerability, that's not that hard to do. I'm not going to cover it here, but essentially this model is just a logistic regression using only publicly available data. If you look at the prioritization prediction report, we actually go through where the data comes from. It's all open source. Six or seven variables are enough. It doesn't even matter which model you use. Uh, what matters is that you have a model that is giving you a score for that vulnerability, that score being, do I think this is risky or not? And so if you look at the top left here, the, it's a, the efficiency is close to 100. And that's because we just know that some things are being successfully exploited. We don't need to look at the CVSS or the Patch Tuesday to know that JBoss from 2010 is still being actively exploited in the wild and people are getting popped on it. The confidence that that is a risk to your environment is 100%. Go ahead and remediate that. But as we drop off, as we go further, we might not have that data. But we do have all of the document information about that vulnerability. All of the words in that description, all of the CVSS subscores, whether or not those exploits exist. And we can use that to try to predict exploitation. That data that I talked about from the SOC environment of here's an event that was tied to a CVE, you already have all that data at all of your environments. It exists in Splunk, it exists in your IDS every time you've seen an alert. So what is it about a vulnerability that increases the probability of causing an alert? Um, if you build that model, no matter how simple it is, what you get is you get granularity. You get the ability to capacity plan. So this one has a trade-off between efficiency and coverage. You can see what I was talking about earlier in that if you want to have 60% coverage, you're not going to have 100% efficiency. We just don't have the data to cover 60% of the known exploits out there because we don't have exploitation data on them. But you do know that you'll have about 80% efficiency in doing that, and you know how many folks you have working on vulnerability management, and you know how many vulnerabilities you can remediate in a given time frame, and you know that by taking that approach, you know your capacity, you know how long it takes you to get there, you might want to walk down that line. You might want to say, first, I want to cover 20% of my known risks out there with 90% efficiency, and then go to your CISO and say, if I want to hit 80%, I know that we're going to get down to 40% efficiency. I know I'm going to need this many more hours, this many more folks, it'll take this long. So being able to plan for your capacity is all about having granular measures of the confidence that something is risky and focusing on the actual risk, which means measuring your efficiency, measuring whether you're wasting time, having an outcome measure. The good news is, is that everybody has that outcome measure. It exists in the SOC. Um, we've got 20 minutes left. I want questions to drive the rest of this. But natural questions would be, what is it about a vulnerability that causes the risk? How do you get this data? All of those I can dive into. Um, more important is that this isn't kind of security data. Everybody has this data at their enterprise, right? You have your vulnerability management scans. You have your asset scans. And your SOC has all the data about what they've seen hit in the past two years. 
So build that outcome measure of the, what they've seen hit and make sure that A, it can't happen again. B, you use that threat intelligence to predict what it is that you should be remediating on the vulnerability management side. That's it. Well, kind of it. 20 minutes of questions. Go ahead. Yep. Which we all think is, you know, bad. It is bad. Yeah, right. <laughs> Could you give us sort of a real-world analysis of that? Or? Uh, yes. Yes. Um... I'm pulling up my RSA talk to have something to show you while we do this. Maybe I don't have the slide that I'm looking for. Let me talk about it first. So when we talk about that vulnerability, what is it about it that makes it likely to be exploited? There's a couple of things there. If you look at, maybe I know how to get this. So we recently published a blog with what we think is going to happen to that vulnerability. The probability that that model that we have running internally is about 90% that it'll be successfully exploited and there's already exploits out there. The reason is which products it affects. It's only 12 of them and all of them are ones that have successful exploitations and at least one of the vulnerabilities in any given patch. The second reason is if you look at the description itself, it's not about the CVSS score of it, although it is high. It's that it is arbitrary code execution by remote attacker. Those words are indi indicators. And it's that we know that proof of concept exploit code already exists. So those are the things that even before NVD has published the vulnerability, you can look at the description of that vulnerability and know that if it has these keywords and it affects these common platform enumerations, it is likely that attackers have an incentive to go after that vulnerability. Um, and this one's actually really incredible because we haven't seen anything predicted to be exploited with a confidence of 90% in the past year except this one vulnerability. 90 is actually pretty high for prediction. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you're looking at that vulnerability, it's really easy to say, yeah, somebody's going to write an exploit, somebody's going to deploy this mass because it's remote, because it affects things that everybody's running. Um, but if you've got a Microsoft patch and it's got 20 vulnerabilities in there and one already has an exploit out there, there's no incentive for an attacker to write an exploit for the other 19, because either you've patched it already, and that second exploit is a waste of time, or you haven't, and they already know about the one that they could use. So things like that come into play. Pre-NVD, of course, you don't know what else is in that release or what else is remediated. Um, what I wanted to pull up, which I will find, I promise, is... is which factors affect a vulnerability. And I'm not, maybe I won't be able to find it. I think I will be able to find it. Um, which essentially, when you look at the breakdown of what is it that causes exploitation in a vulnerability, let's see. I'm just gonna play this slide because that's the one we were talking about. Um, when you look at those factors that are indicative the best way to do it is to look at the text data of the vulnerability. What I was alluding to when I started this is that the description of a vulnerability, and it doesn't just have to come from NVD, it could come from the actual advisories that NVD links to, is a whole bunch of text that describes a couple things. It describes the mechanism of action. It describes whether or not it's detected in the wild or not. Words like in the wild are keywords in the description that are way more valuable than any CVSS score. Um, it describes how it was found, what the likely effect is. Microsoft will pontificate about it for a long time. You pull all those words in, and you just do something as simple as tagging all of the words, pulling them out. So what we do is we pull out 250 different words that are usually common in vulnerabilities, things like buffer overflow, 
remote code execution, or .c, .h together in a Word document is important. Um, each one of those becomes a feature in a simple regression model. Either it has it or it doesn't. If it has arbitrary code execution, chances are your logistic regression is much higher. And then on top of that, you add in, so I think of it as the text information. Then there's the reference information. So who's talking about it? Do you have one advisory link from Microsoft, or do you have 40 different blog posts that NVD is talking about, which means that people are actually working on this thing, or we know that it's already exploited in the wild? Um, so words, references, metadata about the exploit, which you may or may not have, which is, is there a proof of concept out there? Is there something in Metasploit already that exists? Um, and then I think that the next most important thing is what, what it affects. So vendors' products. Common platform remuneration is a very ignored part of vulnerability management, but it might be the most important one in that if it's a Microsoft-only vulnerability that affects these six products, that's probably risky because it's Microsoft. If it's a completely different vendor, like a Wireshark vulnerability, it's probably not going to have a developed exploit. But if it affects six different vendors and 20 different products, you already know it's a library vulnerability that's a huge target of opportunity for attackers. So even just the metadata of how many vendors, how many products, how many versions does it affect is important information in that regression. Who wants first? Because what kind of attacks? Well, depends what kind of phishing we're talking about. I mean, user interaction vulnerabilities on Microsoft are how most of those phishing things work, right? Or on Google Chrome or taking compromise of a browser. If you've got things fully up to date, you're much less exposed to it. Of course, there are phishing attacks that require somebody to log in and do a wire transfer, and I can't help you with that. Right. So the threat intelligence is that all of threat intelligence is what are attackers doing and what are those attackers. I'm saying for the vulnerability management use case, only a subset of that intelligence matters, which is exploit intelligence. How frequently are we using which attack paths? What are attackers actually deploying and who's getting compromised on what? Tells me whether this version of PowerPoint is susceptible to a crafted PPTX or not, whether or not that attack can actually affect it. And so what I'm saying is, in the SOC, threat intelligence has many uses, such as phishing compromise, such as network compromise that might not be vulnerability-based, might have an indicator of compromise that there's some malicious activity happening. But when it comes to preventative controls that help the SOC out, there's a piece of it you can strip out, which is not about the who or the what, it's about the how. Exploit intelligence, vulnerability intelligence, the metadata about how frequently these things are used is your outcome measure for which vulnerabilities you should be remediating in the first place. So you're right, there's a whole other subset of threat intelligence that's useful for the SOC in a different way, but there's a piece of it that we seem to keep siloed in the SOC that is actually way more useful for VM than it is for the SOC. And I actually, I've seen his data about that. So the cost of an exploit is something great to throw into a model. I haven't done that yet. But which exploits are more effective would give you an even better model than just is it going to be exploited or not. Like his cost estimates as your outcome measure instead of just yes or no would be an even better model to build. There's a, there's a bunch of secret sauce here, um, and I'm going to give it away. So the naive approach would be to throw it at a neural net and get all the features that you could get, but that would be stupid because we actually know some things about vulnerabilities that a neural net does not. Um, I know that the words that matter in a description of a vulnerability are vulnerability, attacker, product. 
So we have these functions that we've built ourselves, but I guess you could do it by just binning things called go around. So we'll look at vulnerability and we'll look at the one word before it, the one word after it, the two words before it, the two words after it, the three words before it, the three words after it. And if you do that for enough words that you know are for sure meaningful, what you're getting are adjectives describing vulnerability. So we'll have a feature called vulnerability remote code execution or um, product header. And then those become descriptions of that document that are trying to tease out meaning instead of just category tags. And that's a uh, that's borrowed from legal document review. So they'll say, like, here's the platen, here's the defendant. Let's go around and see what's around that. And that's what they use to classify relevant to the case. I agree. Incredibly. Incredibly. Um, I, measure, I saw that talk, and we measured it as a baseline. So if you don't have any data and all you're remediating is metasploits, you're if, so if you randomly pick a vulnerability out of exploit DB and you remediate it, the chance that it's exploited is 17%. You randomly pick a metasploit vulnerability, it's 25%? No. It's 36%, so significantly better than CVSS 10 or any other strategy if you're just remediating in Metasploits. If you look at the overlap of something that was first published in ExploitDB, then in Metasploit, so somebody looked at the proof of concept, then developed the weaponized thing, that probability jumps up to like 45%. So there's only a small portion of them. You're going to go through about 600 vulnerabilities that way, but you're absolutely right that you know, there's also a baseline here. There's a lot, we could say a lot about being super efficient and having a lot of coverage, but there's a baseline where, like, if you have remote code executable metasploits across your network somewhere, this is not useful information to you. You've got to go there first. And that's a much better strategy than saying we fix criticals within 30 days. A much better strategy is to say we fix all metasploits first, and then we'll think about the rest. Um, in the version two of the, the volume two of the report, we actually have a breakdown of measuring Metasploit by itself as a strategy. Yes. Yeah, so that's really astute. So nobody patches a vulnerability. People deploy a patch. A patch might have 20 vulnerabilities. It might have one vulnerability. Um, so the pivot table is really how you should look at this. And um, I'll att attach a link when I post the slides. We have a report that looks at the pivot table, which is which patches should you be applying? Because what you're talking about is there's this like ephemeral concept of patch supersedence. This one comes first, this one comes second. But there's no reason why one comes first and second other than it covers the rest or it came out later. Um, risk is actually a really good way to do patch supersedence. I know that I need to address these three vulnerabilities. The best way to do that is to deploy this patch that addresses those three and a couple others. So we go through how you pick the right patch to deploy out of a bunch of ones that supersede each other when you really want to only remediate this vulnerability. So let's say you could just fix this vuln or you could fix these three. Maybe this one is not as risky as you want, but this one also has risk. Deploy this patch instead. Um, patch speed has a really huge effect on people's coverage. And so while picking the right vulnerabilities to remediate is very important, perhaps even more important is how quickly can you deploy a patch once you've made a decision, which goes towards that guidance as well. Right. 
Um, hopefully next year, further research for us would be to look at not remediation rates per product, but remediation rates per vulnerability. So on average, how quickly does somebody remediate this one CVE? And whether or not that is a good average or a bad average based on what attackers are doing. And that'll come from things like that. Like that data will show up because people will remediate some Microsoft volumes way later because it requires a service pack. We're good. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>